this is my little presentation on amateur radio. What it is, what it isn't, sorry, what it is, why it isn't CB, and why it is more popular than ever. Uh, <clears throat> the, the logo you see there is actually the international symbol for amateur radio, comprising an inductor, a ground rod, and an antenna, and those are sort of the three things that every radio has in common. Uh, I'm going to start off with a little bit of history, uh, go into a few of the technicalities, nothing too deep, and I'll move on to like all the various things we do and talk a bit about the time uh, I my radio club helped uh, school link up with the International Space Station. So um, we'll begin. Oh. If I can find where my mouse is going. There we go. So um, before we begin, I should point out that the history of radio is amateur radio. Um, Guillermo Marconi had no formal education and when he was 20 years old, he cobbled together his first transmitter and receiver from various bits and pieces he found and cobbled together and demonstrated it to his mother and his brother in his in their kitchen. Um, so, yeah, like he was an amateur at the time. Like I say, no formal education. He just went out and read all the books by the prominent scientists and sort of figured that the work Heinrich Hertz was doing on waves and frequency you know, could help him develop radio, uh, and which he did. And of course, the minute he became the first, he invented his first radio, he became a radio pro because one thing he was better at than technology was monetizing his inventions, something he did aggressively so. So I will now move on to a little bit of history. And it's not not com not complete. There's missing a lot of uh, key things, but it's more sort of showing how amateur radio and professional radio, so to speak, intertwined over the years. So we start off in... 1894, when uh, Marconi invented radio. Two years later, he uh, he got his UK patent for the for his invention, and the po almost immediately the post office realizing there was something in this. They had they started paying him to develop equipment for them. Um, in 1900, a Brazilian priest called Landel de Moura sent the first audio wirelessly. Now, uh, reading up on it, it wasn't good quality audio. It was they were, he was using a modified spark gap transmitter, but it was audible as a sound as opposed to a click or a carrier wave that was just being switched on and off, which is why radio worked up until that point. Uh, 1901 is very significant because that's like the birth of amateur radio, so to speak. So since when Marconi invented radio, everyone was getting in on it, but they were doing it for money. So there was these two 8th graders, and they would have been 12 or 13, basically went out and built their own transmitter and receiver, and that's considered the birth of amateur radio in terms of people doing it just for personal pleasure as opposed to doing it for money. Uh, in 1906, Westinghouse engineer Reginald Fessenden used the recently invented vacuum tube to broadcast the first amplitude modulation signals. Uh, still in use today for broadcast AM radio and it's used for ship-to-shore communications, well, in a modified form called SSB, which I'll come to later. In 1908, the world's first amateur radio club was founded, the uh, Columbia University Amateur Radio Club. 1910, another significant moment for radio amateurs. Uh, in the UK, the Postmaster General, realising that a lot of people were starting to play around with radio just for fun, and it was getting in the way of the professionals, so to speak, he started issuing call signs, as it was his prerogative, and he basically said to all the people doing this for fun, you have to get a call sign, and you have to identify yourself every time you go on air. So if there was any interference calls, they could be tracked down. Um, uh, 1912 is considered the first uh, significant piece of legislation relating to radio in the terms of regulating it. Up to that point, it was a free-for-all. Uh, various governments around the world realised that there's something in this that's useful for the military, it's useful for commercial purposes, so we should re and also for safety, so we should start regulating it. And uh, one of the things that actually uh, introduced was a requirement for all ships uh, that travelled more than five miles from the coast or carried more than 50 people to have a radio on board, uh, which is kind of prescient because a few weeks after the act was passed, Titanic uh, uh, met her demise, uh, uh, but, and luckily had a radio on board. Okay, 1920, uh, WWJ Detroit becomes the first regular radio broadcast station in the sense of what we now know as a radio station broadcasting entertainment, news, sports, and advertisements. Uh, it's still going today under the ownership of CBS. 
Uh, Marconi in the UK launches the first UK broadcast station, which was the Experimental 2MT. Uh, later that year, 2MT was passed to a company called the British Broadcasting Company and renamed 2LO. No idea what happened to them. Can't find any information on them whatsoever. Um, they probably crashed and burned. Um, 1923, uh, American amateur Fred Schnell and French amateur Leon Deloy make the first transatlantic contact. Again, this quite a significant thing because at the time they were probably just using homemade equipment made from whatever they could find. Uh, 1925, the foundation of the International Amateur Radio Union to sort of regu- you know, uh, coordinate amateur radio globally. 1927, the first International Radio Telegraph Conference defines who can use different parts of the radio spectrum. So uh, I've, there's, like, the whole radio spectrum is divided up into bands which belong to various groups and users. For example, uh, um, in the high, frequ- the high frequency part of the radio spectrum, the uh, Four and a half to five and a half is for uh, transoceanic aviation contact. So that's planes contacting uh, where they're coming from or going going to, but they're when they're out at sea, where VHF won't work. Um, like eighty-eight to one hundred eight megahertz is broadcast radio. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, and amateurs have got their sections. The military have got their sections. It's all it's all split up, and it's all mostly internationally coordinated. But there are differences. 1933, Robert Moore uh, invents single sideband as an amateur. He did it for fun, um, but it, was, it's, it had a massive impact on the history of radio, which I'll come to later uh, when, I'll, uh, when I explain why. Uh, so World War II, as you can probably gather, radio technology development massively accelerated. We got radar, all sorts of new equipment came on the, uh, on the scene and uh, original uh, fundamental research massively accelerated and it just changed it just massively changed the game. Uh, 1941, uh, Fac- Fuller Maximilian Kolbe uh, was executed by the Nazis because he they thought he was a spy. Um, later in 1982, he was canonized, and he's now the patron saint of amateur radio operators, if if you're into that kind of thing. That's kind of, I always find that fascinating, though. Uh, 1947, um, transistor is invented, uh, so that basically started the it was the beginning of the end for the vacuum tube. Uh, made radio smaller, more reliable, uh, safer. And it was, it was no, as you probably gather, it's not just radio, but just about anything electronic was impacted by the invention of the transistor. 1961, the first Oscar one was the first amateur radio satellite that was launched. Yes, amateurs actually have satellites in space that we use to communicate with. Not as sophisticated as the commercial and military satellites, but you know, it's for the fact that we're doing this. For, for fun and using whatever money and materials we can get our hands on. I think that's quite significant. Uh, some of them for the U- uh, people in the UK be interested in. Uh, Rod- Reginald Silvey, who is an amateur on the Falkland Islands, secretly contacts Bob North in Scotland via amateur relo and re- radio and relays on Argentinian positions on the islands because the Argentinians had basically shut down all regular communication in out of the island. And he had some quite uh, high success in doing that. So... Moving on from the history, just a quick picture of old versus new shacks. The one on the left, I can't get an exact date on it, but I reckon it's around 1915. Uh, literally, back then, there wasn't companies making gear for amateur radio enthusiasts. Uh, you made your own components. If you um, People would make it out of old car parts, bicycle parts, you, you name it, whatever they could get their hands on, they would go out and make it. On the right, we have um, what some people refer to as one black box talking to another. Uh, modern amateur radio is you know, it's it's very much off the, a lot of it's off the shelf. Um, crazy thing is there, I would estimate the investment of equipment in that picture is probably in the region of fifteen to twenty thousand pounds. So just to get it out of the way, because <laughs> every time I mention to someone I'm interested in amateur radio, they go turn four, break or broke. And I kind of it's just it's just just all the enthusiasm enthusiasm drains out of me, so I'll just go and tell what the big difference between the two is. For CB, the equipment has to be type approved, so you buy a CB radio and you're not allowed to modify it. Um, it's actually illegal, but a lot of people do. For an amateur radio, you can buy it off the shelf, but you're also legally entitled to make your own, modify what you have, so long as you stay within the legal limits of um, transmission power and interference. CB, maximum power is 5 watts. Amateur radio, you can go up to 1.5 kilowatts, depending on what you're doing. 
CB, uh, you don't have frequencies, you have channels, you have 40 or 80, depending on if you have a, a UK model or a European model. Don't uh, That isn't really affected by Brexit. It's it's not uh, it's regulated by an organization called SEPT, who are separate to the European Union. Uh, amateur radio, you can use any frequency you want within any of our allocated bands. Um, in CB, you can say what you want. Although a lot of CB operators use 10 codes and give themselves call signs, that's just their own personal preference. There's no li You can say what you want. An amateur radio, you have to use your call sign, for, uh, and there are certain codes you have to use, Q codes, for example, which tell other people what you intend to do. Uh, CB purpose is primarily voice communication. In amateur radio, it's voice data, uh, amateur TV, communication, experimentation, telemetry, science. There's so much going on. Uh, with CB, there's no license needed. You used to have to buy a license, but it was just, uh, I think it was like 15 points back in the 80s, but then they did away with it. And in amateur radio, you have to have a license and you have to pass the exam to get it. So I'll give you the boring definition before we go on. This is the definition from the International Telecommunications Union. Uh, radio communication service for the purpose of self-training, intercommunication, and technical investigations ca carried out by amateurs, that is, by duly authorized persons interested in radio solely with a personal aim and without pecuniary interest. So it's a really long-winded definition, but it covers it. So I'm going to get into a little bit of technical stuff here. Um, I've tried to keep it as simple as possible. And it's something you just, it's the sort of stuff you might go, I didn't know that. And you might learn something from it. If not, it's only a few slides. And then I'll be moving on to more interesting stuff that you might find more interesting. So amateurs operate in frequencies from 137 kilohertz, which is way down the very bottom, up to 47 megahertz, which is up in the microwave bands. Generally, uh, the bands are the same internationally, but there are some regional differences. Um, below 30 megahertz is called the high frequency portion, which is weird because you would assume that's the, the very bottom of the radio spectrum. And the reason for that is in the early days of radio, they thought 30 megahertz was crazy high. So they just called that high frequency. And then as time went on and they realized that there was usable portions of the radio spectrum above that, that's when they came up with very high frequency, ultra high frequency and super high frequency. And they are uh, above 30 megahertz. The difference between the two is anything below 30 megahertz, you can potentially send a signal the whole way around the world using ionospheric propagation, which I'll come to. Above uh, 30 megahertz, it's usually line of sight, so um, it won't bounce around the world, although there are some limited exceptions, which I'll cover in a bit. Okay, um, I'll, try and, I'll get through this as quick as I can. Uh, every radio signal takes up a certain amount of bandwidth. That's the amount of radio spectrum it uses up. For example, CW, continuous wave, what we call Morse code, takes up 300 hertz. It's very narrow. Um, AM communications, that is like when you're using AM to talk to, to you know, uh, person to person as opposed to broadcast, 6 kilohertz. So that's like, you can see that's several times bigger than CW. Single sideband, which is half an AM signal, and I'll come to that, 3 kilohertz. AM broadcast, 10 FM communications, that's like walkie-talkies and shopping centers, 10 kilohertz. But FM broadcast takes up 100. So you can see how um, uh, like the, the better quality signals take up more bandwidth. The byproduct of that is though, a narrower bandwidth signal can be detected further away for the same amount of power. So a CW signal going out at 10 watts will travel a lot further and be detectable a lot further away than an AM signal on the same power. Uh, but the, another flip side to that is the higher the frequency, the more detail that can be embedded in the signal. That's why 5G signals are up in the microwave uh, portion of the band. It's um, And the main reason for that is there's more space to uh, do frequency modulation. That is where you embed the signal by changing the signal. I'll come to that in a bit. Um, also, uh, another rule is higher frequency signals attenuate faster. That means they lose their strength faster. And that's simply because moisture in the air absorbs the energy. Um, so that doesn't happen with lower frequency signals. Um, but another rule is, hope I'm not boring you here. Lower frequency signals are more susceptible to the inter interference than high bandwidths. So 
sorry, lower frequencies are more susceptible to interference, and that's interference that comes from the Earth itself, but also things like um, electrical devices being switched on or off or being close to an electrical substation. There's so many things can affect low frequency signals. So you want to keep the signal with as minimum bandwidth as possible. Hope I'm not boring you here. <laughs> so first thing is we're looking into how do you push a signal further? Uh, so like I said, AM signals are six kilohertz, but it's a sine wave. And the strength of the audio being embedded in the signal changes the strength of the signal. So, that it, so the amplitude of the signal is directly related to the audio waveform that you're sending. And since audio, an audio waveform is a sine wave, you can cut it in half and recreate it on the other end. So you cut the bandwidth down to 3 kilohertz, potentially doubling the distance that signal can travel. It won't always be double as there was all sorts, sorts of environmental factors, but, you know, you're getting close to it. Uh, and this is why I was talking about the guy Robert Murray inventing single sideband. All commercial non-broadcast radio traffic on the HF bands must use single sideband. So ships out at sea, airplanes traveling overhead, the, um, they all have to use single sideband uh, transmissions because the signal travels further and because it's of a narrower bandwidth it's less susceptible to interference. Uh, the military uses it too, of course, but they, um, uh, and also you can embed digital signals onto SSB, but I won't, I won't go there. So there's a quick demonstration of what I mean by the modulation. So if you've got, the, if you look at the signal at the top being uh, the audio waveform, in AM, <clears throat> the strength of the signal changes to match the audio waveform. And you get, the problem there is like, so many things affect, can affect the strength of the signal or would, you know, uh, if it passes through uh, clouds or snow or, uh, like you say, like when a motor, uh, say like um, a gas boiler starts, the spark generates a massive wideband signal. And what happens is some of the strength of that signal will mix in with that AM signal and distort it. FM, on the other hand, the, the amplitude stays the same constantly, but the frequency jumps around the carrier signal so when you tune into say 100 megahertz a radio station on 100 the actual frequency is jumping between 99 point uh 99.95 megahertz and 100.05 megahertz um but the strength stays the same so then so it's like by changing the frequency <laughs> i'll come to that <laughs> Yeah, so I'm seeing, yes, uh, James, I'm seeing your, uh, uh, I'll come to that in a minute. So, um, I hope this makes sense. Uh, so, yeah, well, I'll just answer that question quickly from James Rigby. Um, to be honest with you, I don't think anyone really cares uh, uh, that much. I think that the future is for broadcast radio is, is online streaming. I don't think anyone accepts that it, that isn't the case. Uh, but for the people who just like to muck around with radio for the for the the science and the uh, the experience, it's we don't care really. We're happy to do our thing, and we don't care if people want to w listen to radio online. And in any case, in amateur radio, we're not actually allowed to to do general broadcasts. That's something we're specifically not allowed to do. We're completely separate from broadcast radio altogether. Um, but yeah, we don't really care. Um, now here's. I'm going to talk about ionospheric propagation. I personally find this fascinating. Others don't. So, uh, like I say, signals below 30 uh, can go around the world. And what happens is you've got these layers. The F layers, F1, F2, the E layer, and the D layer. And these are ionospheric layers, of elect and they're electrically charged layers in space. If you send out a signal and the, the layer is appropriately charged, and uh, what affects it the most is the sun. Uh, and also um, solar flares. Uh, you want the, the layer to be nicely charged up. And what happens is your signal gets into that layer, but then it bounces around and comes out somewhere. And you can send, that means potentially your signal can go to the other side of the earth. In some cases, it can come back around to you. Um, it's, and it's fascinating this, how this can happen. And that, as you see there, as the frequency increases, and that's when you're getting onto the VHF portion, it starts to punch through these layers and go off into space and dissipate. Now, I mentioned that sometimes VHF can 
have the same sort of characteristics. And, and the E layer, on certain days you get what's known as sporadic E propagation, and that means, again, it's all to do with the sun. It's hard to predict, and generally what happens is when someone discovers this is happening, it happens over a patch of the, uh, the atmosphere. It might be like an area the size of London that's sitting above you, and you can bunch your signal off that. And instead of your VHF signal only going as far as line of sight, you can start talking to someone in Germany or Poland. Uh, you don't get as far as you get with HF propagation, but it's still you know, pretty impressive. And um, But yeah, so if I move on to the next slide, you can see what I mean by the bouncing. So it gets them into the layer, bounces down, bounces off Earth, and eventually it comes out somewhere. Uh, to give you an idea how crazy that can be, one of my best contacts ever was contacting someone in Japan from the cheap homemade antenna that I have in my yard on only five watts of power. Uh, so that's the, that's the sort of you know, potential you have when the conditions are in your favor. Uh, also, it's, it's also related to sunspot cycles. Currently, we are in the lowest. Uh, the sunspot uh, the, the sunspot cycle takes uh, nine years. Sorry, set nine years. It was at the bottom last year. Sorry, two thousand nineteen. So we're currently heading towards uh, a solar sunspot maximum, which should take place in two thousand four, two thousand five. In theory, that means we'll be able to send our signals further, hopefully. So, uh, but that's it's it's a fascinating thing if you want to read up on it. But I just think it's amazing how you can just talk to someone so far away using a radio in your backyard if you if you if the conditions are in your favour. Okay, a little talk on antennas, and then we'll move away from the technical stuff. <laughs> okay, um, all antennas have a resonant frequency at which all energy is radiated. So that means if you put 10 watts of energy into the antenna, 10 watts of uh, energy is radiated into the atmosphere. It's defined by the size of the antenna. So if you take the most simple ham radio antenna, it's a dipole, two pieces of wire, you take uh, no, two pieces of wire attached to a coaxial in the middle. Uh, so what you want it to be is, you first you need to find the wavelength for the signal. So the wavelength is 300. Uh, which is the uh, uh, shorthand for the speed of light divided by the frequency. So let's say you want to transmit on 7 megahertz. 300 divided by 7 megahertz is 42.85 meters. That's the wavelength of that frequency. And if you remember back in this, I don't know if you remember back in the 70s and 60s, it was, free, it was common to refer to radio stations using their wavelength instead of their frequency. Uh, radio 1 uh, famously called, uh, said they were on 247 meters. Uh, and they were like way down in the AM section of the band. Uh, but uh, a dipole um, has to be a half wavelength in length to be at resonant frequency. So you divide that by two, uh, roughly 21.42 meters. Uh, you cut that in half, join, them, join two ends to a piece of coax. And then if you put that frequency in, a signal with that frequency, it'll just fully dissipate into the environment. And it'll, it'll go, travel the maximum distance. However, the problem is, is what if you want to use a lower frequency? Well, what happens then is the energy hits the end of the wire and bounces back um, because you have to kind of imagine it like a tube. You know, if it, if it, you know, it wants to get to the end, and if it can't, but if there's something stopping it reaching the place it wants to go, it'll bounce back. That, that causes interference in the signal since the signal coming back is mixing with the signal coming out. Uh, it can also damage your radio, uh, and it's something you really don't want to do because it will cause your neighbor's interference. It's 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 a cardinal sin of amateur radio, and by law, you have to have, um, if, you, if you're not using a resonant antenna, you have to have a device called an antenna tuner unit, an antenna tuning unit to fix it. So uh, the ratio of energy coming back is known as the standing wave ratio. And what you want is one, ideally. Uh, one and a half isn't too bad. Two is acceptable, but above that, you're getting into territory where you're, you're gonna cause problems. So here we have an inside of an antenna tuning unit. So basically what it does is the energy that's being returned back is redirected into the ground. And um, so it doesn't hit your radio. Uh, and as you can see, it's a fairly simple passive device. You've got two variable airspace capacitors and an inductor. There are modern solid state versions of these, which are much smaller. And instead of you having to turn the knobs to tune the antenna, they do it automatically. But they're pricey, and a lot of anti uh, amateurs just like to do it the old-fashioned way. Uh, also, and, of, and of course, you can use a higher frequency with um, 
a lower uh, an antenna that's resonant on a lower frequency won't do any damage but it will affect the signal pattern and i'll come on to signal pattern in a bit okay uh, this is um an example uh, demonstration of what i mean by why the size length size of an antenna matters this is the liz nagarvey uh transmitting station just outside lisburn in northern ireland uh, that antenna is called the blow Knox big belly antenna and it was put up in 1936 developed by a company called Blow Knox, an American company. They, <clears throat> at the time, they marketed these as amazing antennas, but they weren't that special, and I think there was only about 20 installed internationally. Uh, the actual metal structure yourself is the radiator. That is what uh, puts out the signal, unlike a lot of, you might think there's wires hanging off that, giving out the signal. No, that's the radiator itself. Um, I think it's got a really nice aesthetic. I love it. And when I'm driving up to Derry to see me man pass it, I, 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 you know, I love it. I think it's just a wonderful an, you know, antenna structure. And the fact that it's so old and still in service is amazing. But you'll notice in the picture, the first picture was taken in the 1950s versus the second picture it was taken a few years ago. Someone sliced the top off. And that is because in the 1970s, Radio Ulster, uh, which broadcasts on AM, increased their frequency. Uh, they went onto a different frequency, a higher frequency. Uh, so rather than, no, they don't deal with antenna tuning units with this level of power. So to make the antenna resonant, they just chopped the top off it and made it smaller. Simple as that. So that's kind of the, the demonstration of why antenna size matters so much in radio, in case you've ever wondered. Uh, so yes, so uh, antenna shape defines the signal pattern. So the size determines the frequency, the shape determines the pattern. Now dipoles radiate energy in a kind of donut shape um you can imagine like a tube running alongside those two wires and that tube expanding so what we do is uh we want the signal to bounce up to space so we put the dipole at an uh, ideally quarter wavelength height easier said than done if you do that you actually bounce the signal up off the ground uh and you kind of uh, get like a v-shaped pattern this is I'll, I'll I'll give I'll give you some links later on if you want to look into this in more detail. The antenna on the right uh, is called a Yagi. It, uh, it's although that's massive that those are those arms sticking out are probably five meters each. It's the exact same kind of antenna you use for receiving TV. You know the antenna that has like a central bar and uh, parallel um, arms. That focuses energy in a beam. So in this case, it would. Uh, uh, it would sort of like be focusing the energy in the direction the flag is flying. So you have a very narrow beam. And again, the beauty of that is because you're not sending the signal out every in all directions, because it's very fo narrowly focused, it'll go, it'll travel further. Uh, uh, but that sort of setup there is crazy expensive. You know, I'd say that's 15, 20,000 pounds to get something like that. And it's, it's the dream of every amateur to have something like that. But it's a question of money and planning permission. Okay, actually, one other thing I'll mention about Yagi's. This might, you might find this fascinating. And I'll bring up my notes. Uh, the Yagi was actually invented in 1926 by a guy called Hidetsu Yagi uh, in uh, of, uh, Tohoku Imperial University in Japan. Uh, he knew it was useful. He knew it was clever. But he didn't know what to do with it. So... Uh, he went and got the, the, the patent on it, um, and he kind of uh, ripped off his partner uh, called uh, Shintaro Uda, who kind of co-developed it with him, but such as business. Uh, anyway, he got the patent, didn't know what to do with it, flew over to the UK and sold it to Marconi. And uh, what they did with it was, in the, when they developed radar, uh, they realized that if you wanted to make a plane-based radar system, the Yagi antenna was the way to go because it was directional, and they started fitting Yagis to the front of airplanes. And it was only in like in the last 1944 and 45 when the Germans realized what was going on. And even though the Japanese captured uh, a radar technician of a crash plane, and they heard you know, when they'd seen the word Yagi in the paperwork, they still didn't understand the significance of this guy's invention uh, and how, you know, it was being used against them. Uh, so there you go. This is an interesting little uh, aside, if you're interested in that kind of thing. So done with all the technicalities, moving on to like, what do we do? Um, and I think I might slow down a bit because I'm ranting on a bit. <clears throat> so some terminology. Uh, I'll just read it out. 
DX is our sort of a code for long distance contacts. And that's basically when you make contact with someone outside of your continent. Q codes are something we have to legally use and it's part of our exam. So it's a shorthand that's designed to avoid confusion. So uh, QSY is, is anyone listening to me? So if, you're, you know, if you finish a call with someone and uh, you're just wondering if there's anyone out there, you go, anyone, QSY, anyone listening? Uh, QST means you're shutting down for the night. QRP uh, means you're operating on low power. So if you're, that's typically under five watts. So I would say CQ, CQ, this is Echo India 2, Hotel November, Bravo, QRP, QRP. And that's basically saying to people, I'm using low power. Uh, and QSL is kind of confirm message received. We, we use number codes. These aren't official. They're derived from Phillips codes used by the Western Union. But the one we use most is 73s. And it's our way of saying best wishes, goodbye. So t t traditionally, when we finish a contact with someone, we'll say 73s or best 73s. And we actually use it in real life too. It's kind of weird, the people looking in. Uh, CQ is the code we have to use to start a brand new conversation. So it's like CQ, CQ, Echo India 2, Hotel November Bravo, calling CQ, CQ. And you repeat that until someone calls back and says their call sign. Uh, okay, I've not used the term ham in this presentation very much, and uh, I don't know, it, it just seems a bit you know, transatlantic for me. Uh, but the term comes from, it's actually a derogatory term used in the early days of ham radio when you know, early ham operators were trying to learn Morse code and the professionals said they were ham-fisted. There are alternative theories as to where the word comes from, but that really... Uh, um, uh, was the most popular theory. Uh, uh, pipes and cigars in France? Yes, they are. Um, it's pretty much standard everywhere. Like uh, that's one of the reasons why I have the Q codes is that even if you're you struggle you struggle with language, the Q codes will help you get across what you're trying to say. So someone in Russia or Japan, they get tested on the Q codes in their exam. So the number the number codes are not official. But everyone still uses them. CQ is international, and uh, the term "ham" is just that's that's nothing. That's just a just a term we use. And um, "silent key" is uh, he's dead. So when we refer to an amateur radio going "silent key," it means it means they've died, and it means several weeks later, everyone from their local amateur radio club will be knocking on the door, offering to buy all offering to buy all the equipment from their widow or widower. <sighs> It's true, <laughs> it happens. But yes, uh, yes, but yeah, the codes are pretty much standard internationally. Oh, the wrong window. Okay, there's not a lot to talk about voice-wise. Um, as you probably imagine, it's the main type of traffic in amateur radio. Uh, on the ham on the HF bands, it's all single sideband. On the um, VHF bands and above, it's usually FM. Uh, but there's no reason why you can't use USB on the VHF bands. And, on, and it's actually becoming more popular lately because the signal travels further. Uh, what do people talk about? Some people only talk about radio, but some people will talk about anything. Although the, the license terms say you're not allowed to say or things which cause trouble, uh, and that's taken to mean religion and politics. So you very, very rarely hear someone talking about religion and politics on amateur radio. We have things called nets, which are basically where everyone gets together at a certain time and just has a bit of a, it's like a chat room and someone takes control and passes control of the conversation around. <laughs> yeah, James Rigby, I got your message. Uh, if the first voice traffic was in 1902, that'll have reached several of our solar systems. Are we expecting a return signal from aliens? Well, you know, a lot of scientists actually believe that could happen. Uh, and we are listening, so well, that's outside the scope of amateur radio. It's uh, a, a SETI, for example. Uh, no, although they've actually shut that down because their computers can't cope with the amount of data they've collected so far. Um, so uh, VHF traffic uh, and on frequencies. So HF voice track of traffic is usually one person talking to another person or in a net. VH tra VHF traffic and above can also be direct like that, but usually it goes through a repeater. And most amateur radio clubs would own a repeater on a nearby mountain. My amateur radio club um, actually owns a couple, and we're lucky that um, RTE, the National State Broadcaster, lets us keep them in their compound. And that's largely because a member of our club is the head of en uh, broadcast engineering for RTE, so that's kind of handy. But, it's, um, but when you go for a repeater, it massively increases the range. 
And also, uh, some repeaters go through the internet. So you can connect from your radio to the local repeater. repeater. That then connects off to via the internet to a repeater in another part of the world and then converts the signal back to radio. Uh, that's called Echolink. Um, and, a, and a lot of people do get into amateur radio just to talk. They have no interest in the technical side of things. They just want to talk to people. And last year, the numbers went through the roof of the amount of people who came into amateur radio because of COVID. And uh, it has provided a lot of comfort to people. So um, like I said, it's not just for technical stuff. Some people just want to talk. They, they say it as CB, but longer distance. Data, right. Uh, talking via computer. So it's basically you run a program on your computer, connect it to your radio using the audio ports, ports and you, you type on your keyboard. It generates a signal, which goes out over your radio, transmits, and then you stop and wait for a response. Um, we still use RITI. RITI radio teletype is still incredibly popular. It's the oldest radio data mode from 1922, still in use. Uh, there are people who really obsess over it and they love it, and you can do it on your computer. Phase shift keying, PSK, it's a, a more recent development and it's it's designed for to be more resilient in the RITI signal and have more characters. Um, and then there's these new modes called JT65, FT8 and FT4 which have been dominating amateur radio lately. Some people love them, these modes. Some people absolutely detest them. Uh, they were designed by a guy called Joe Taylor, uh, Kilo One uh, Juliet Tango. He is uh, works for Princeton University, and he has a Nobel Prize in Physics. He's a genius. Uh, the unique thing about these modes is you can actually detect the signal below, below the noise floor. So let's say, for example, you just switch your radio on, and, uh, an AM radio or an FM radio, and you tune to noise. Well, he can ask you know that's the noise floor in your area you can send out one of these signals which isn't detectable in that background noise but when you plug it into the software he has developed it'll find the signal and the beauty of it is it means that people can contact there's no reason why even someone with the most basic radio and worst antenna can't co contact someone reliably and regularly on the other side of the world it's it's just crazy how good this is and that's why it's become so popular because people can now build up the number of contact international contacts they have so quickly uh, and it's free he gives it all the way for free and the source code as well um now one thing i will say about data it's not about the uh, when we talk about data we're not talking about the internet we're primarily to primarily talking about one amateur radio and their computer uh talking to another amateur radio enthusiast with their computer and sending the signal uh, over the air we, when we refer to the internet, we have a different term. So this is a program called uh, FL Digi, and that runs many modes. But this is what a chat using PSK looks like in FL Digi. Uh, and if the thing at the bottom here, the, the as we call it, the, the waterfall here, that is 3 kilohertz wide. It's an SSB, a single SSB frequency signal. But in that, you can embed multiple chats. So multiple people can be having multiple chats within the same frequency. It's, it's quite amazing. Uh, and this is WJS, WSJTX, which is the software that runs JT65, FT8, and um, uh, FT4. Uh, like I say, the problem with this is it's not really a chatting mode. You can't just type randomly type stuff in. It's You send your call sign, the call sign of the person you're contacting, a signal report, your location code, and that's pretty much it. But again, if you look at the top, that, that's a two kilohertz wide. Uh, that's a two kilohertz wide uh, uh, portion of the bandwidth, and there's multiple signals in there, and you could easily cram in another one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven conversations into that single frequency. So it's 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 very clever stuff. Um, uh, yes. Okay. We have TV as well. We have amateur television. Um, slow scan TV is basically a form of colourful radio effects. What you do is you broadcast a picture uh, and you put your call sign on it. And if you're trying to make contact with someone, you just write QCQ -C on the picture. And the person who answers you would answer you with their, your call sign and their call sign on their picture. And you'd send them back and forward until you were complete. Uh, it was traditionally analog. It's been around since the 70s. But because being analog and operating in VHF, it's prone to interference. There is a digital version called EasyPal, and it's quite impressive. It's, it uses a lot of error correction to ensure that you get a perfect image. 
We also have fast scan TV, which to everyone else is normal television. Uh, we, you know, like we'll when TV com- uh, when TV companies moved to digital, like we a lot of amateur radio clubs went out and grabbed and it was like we have your old equipment, and a lot of the time they just give it to us. And my radio club has a fast scan TV repeater sitting up on the mountain, and what you do is. You, uh, we use generally it's old satellites, uh, television equipment that we use for um, transmitting backwards and forwards. I'm not going to go into detail. It's a very specialised area of the hobby, and it's quite complex. So I'll skip over it. But it, it's it's there if you find it interesting. So here's an um, example of what fa- a slow scan television looks like. This is an application called RS SSTV, and that's receiving a image. Uh, an image and it came from uh, ON6MU and that's uh, Austria. And no, actually, that's the guy that developed it. Actually, here's some other examples of the sort of images you, you see. Um, now, the top left one is interesting because DS is South Korea, so that's an interesting image to send. Uh, the one next to that, that's an Easy Pal digital image. The third one, the, Aust- the Australian one, that's VK is Australia. Uh, that's the no, that's them. Someone calling CQ. Bottom left is an example of the interference you get. Middle middle bottom is uh, digital SSTV, as is the one on the bottom right, which looks like a crypt, or is it a um, medieval cell? I don't know. Yes, that's the sort of stuff. You also get a lot of um, people who have put out vaguely soft porn, and I don't really like it, and it's, uh, it's always been an issue in the hobby that uh, that sort of stuff should be stopped, but you know, some people do what they want. Telemetry science, this is uh, sort of where the hobby has been growing. Uh, like like if you're if you need to use radio communication somehow for telemetry or testing or whatever, you could use the IS International um, Industrial Scientific and Medical Bands, which is license free, but the power is limited and they're crowded. It's used by doorbells, garage door openers, kids remote control toys. So if you've got an amateur radio license, you can use that whole range of frequencies available to you uh, for free, so long as you're not, as long as it's academic, because you can't make personal gain. Uh, I used a lot in astronomy, where a lot of people would use would bounce signals off into space to try and hit objects in space, like meteors, meteor scatter, the moon, just for whatever research they do. Uh, solar and ionospheric res- uh, research, that's, like, so that's uh, analysing how the sun is affecting our atmosphere. Where there is a huge network of uh, what's known as whisper beacons, WSPR, or wide signal propagation reporting. Uh, what that is, is uh, it just constantly broadcasts a signal from someone's house. And computers all around the world try to pick up these signals. <clears throat> and from that, analyzing the strength of the signal, they can work out how the ionosphere is behaving and how the sun is affecting Earth. Um, <clears throat> pardon me, let's get a drink. Um, it's used a lot for telemetry tracking. So, if someone sends a balloon up and for science purposes, maybe a Weller balloon or some kind of research balloon, uh, and they've got an amateur radio license, they've got frequencies available for telemetry. It's also used a lot in experiment of people are developing remote control vehicles and stuff like that. We have our own data mode called APRS, Amateur Packet Reporting Service, and that's actually designed for telemetry. Uh, it's also a global messaging system, so we can use APRS to. You know, send back telemetry data from experiments. Uh, there's a network of Weller stations that amateurs run, which also sends back Weller information. Or we can just, uh, if you've got a radio that's APRS equipped, you can send out a text message to anyone in the world, and it'll get to them. It'll just be bounced from one radio uh, receiving station to the next. And if there's if there's one missing, they'll just send it over the internet. And then at the other end, they'll send it out by radio again. Um, very clever stuff. No worries. Have a good have a good evening. Stick up. Okay, so this uh, summits on the air, lighthouses on the air. Now this is where radio, amateur radio gets active because uh, we don't have a great reputation for uh, physical activity. Uh, summits on the air is probably the most famous one. So basically, you climb a mountain and make a radio contact. Uh, the height of the mountain uh, affects how many points you get, and it's a it's an ongoing thing. Uh, there's, it's not like a one off event. Um, the rarity of the mountain, so if you climb a mountain that doesn't isn't climbed very often, that gets you more points. So it's kind of combining exercise, enjoying the outdoors of making radio contacts. Lighthouses on the air, it's the same, but from a lighthouse, usually beside the lighthouse because you can't get into them. Islands on the air, <laughs> you're probably guessing where this is going. <laughs> um, 
There's also Youth on the Air and Jamboree on the Air, which is a big scout event every October. So these are kind of like you no know, events where they're trying to get people out and active and in the open air to use the radio. Uh, now this is my personal portable radio setup, which I would use when I'm uh, uh, go out and about. Uh, the radio is an Elecraft KX3. Um, the the battery on the left fits underneath it, underneath the panel. Uh, and the two gizmos on the top right. The top one is a solar charge controller, so I can actually plug in a solar panel to charge the battery. And the little device below that is just a watt meter, telling me how powerful the you know, how much power is left in the battery. And uh, that's a HF radio, and there's it's limited to 12 watts, whereas most base station radios are, lim uh, are around 100 watts. But I've had some really good contacts with that. I can also attach it to my laptop as well if I need to. It's a lovely piece of radio. Yes, there should be chapter on the air. <laughs> uh, and here's another. This is a SOTA activation. So uh, they use the term activation to act when, for when they start transmitting. Um, that looks quite cold, but, you know, they're having fun. Uh, internet. This is what this is a fairly modern term that's come about lately about connecting amateur radio to the internet. Um, it's I'm not going to go into too much detail, uh, but a PSK mail is a, a fairly recent application that uses PSK data to access the web over high frequency radio. So what you can do is you access, you have a program you run and you say I want this website. It sends out a signal for your radio to a PSK reception station, and these are run by volunteers free of charge. And there's about 40 in Europe, and there's about the same number in America, and there's a couple in Australia. Uh, the server at that receiving radio will go off into the internet, grab the web page, and then send it back to you. It's not the fastest, but if you're in the middle of nowhere, it's perfectly fine. Windmail is um, an email over high frequency radio, it's extremely popular with. Uh, Ocean going sailors. So, like, if you've got a fancy, expensive yacht and you like to travel between Britain and America or whatever, uh, and you don't want to pay for satellite uh, internet, Windmail does the job. It'll get your email. Um, another big thing lately is modifying consumer routers to work on amateur frequencies and operate in mesh mode. So that basically means instead of operating at 800, 600, or 1800 megahertz, uh, they work on amateur radio frequencies and they mesh. So mesh means instead of the router having to be connected to a broadband line, it can connect to another router over radio if that one's got a broadband line. So uh, so it's basically relaying the signal between routers and therefore stretching the number, the amount of people that can connect to a single broadband line. It's it's hard, but it's, it's becoming popular. Uh, we've got packet radio. It's not as popular as it used to be. Packet radio is where you would access a bulletin board. So that was actually first developed in 1978. Uh, so, and that, that was literally, you'd connect to someone running an amateur radio bulletin board and exchange messages or things like that. Uh, just out of interest, if you've, ever, you've never seen an IP address beginning 44, that because it belongs to amateur radio. It's for amateur radio application only. Uh, and people are trying to buy it because that block is worth a lot of money because IP version 4 address spaces uh, was exhausted a few years back. But, uh, it's not for sale. <laughs> okay, contesting. Right. This is where you try to make as many contacts in a given period. Uh, it could be as an hour, several days. Uh, it could be regional or international. And there's usually some sort of specific type, type of traffic target. It might be voice only, Morse only. You might have to operate outdoors, or it might only be on a data mode, or you may only be able to operate on battery power or solar power. Uh, some people, uh, this is the thing is, contesters are an interesting bunch. Some of them take it extremely serious. Um, like there's people who, who will do a 48 hour contest and sit at the radio for 48 hours nonstop, trying to make as many contacts as they can. It's crazy. Uh, some people, they invest 50K easily, 50,000 pounds in the top, you know, the best gear and best antenna for so they can win these contests. And what do you win? A certificate or maybe a nice trophy. There's never a cash prize. There's never a prize of value. You're doing it just for pride. It's it's. An, I'm not really interested in contesting, with the exception of the SSB Field Day, which is more of a fun thing that takes part. That's an international contest that takes parts that takes a takes place every August, um, and that's kind of what it looks like. <laughs> this was a few years back. Uh, my club heads off to a place called Ballina Slow, and uh, yeah, it's. Um, uh, it can be quite miserable at times, but it's a bit of fun. Okay, emergency assistance. This is another big thing about amateur radio. 
Uh, there's an organization in the UK called the Radio Amateurs Emergency Network, RAINET. It was founded after the 1953 North Sea floods, which uh, destroyed the communications infrastructure on the east coast of the UK. Most other countries have similar organizations in America. It's called RS Amateur Radio Ameri uh, Emergency Service. In Ireland, it's called ARIN, Amar Amar Amateur Radio Emergency Network. Um, their, their, their significance has dropped in developed countries. But it's, these organizations are incredi incredibly important in less developed parts of the world, which are suffer natural disasters. Uh, they're, they, they're still important during hurricane season in America, where they would be used a lot to relay hurricane sight sightings. But during, uh, like last two years ago, during Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, uh, like basically 100 radio amateurs from America went down to help get a communication system up and running. Uh one of the benefits of amateur radio is we can we can operate our radios off grid and with reduced power. Uh, and generally, what happens is when they're needed, the, the any ex existing primary infra communications infrastructure is reserved for the Im immediate relief of the emergency services. And the amateur radios take you know, take on the second level stuff like exchanging lists of patients in hospitals or trying to find people who have gone missing or relaying you no. Know, uh, what equipment is needed in a certain area. The problem with this is this is the one part of amateur radio that has really been struggling to find people to, t to help out with. You know, it's, it's gone from being something that, you no know, the UK would have had like a thousand people in Raynet 20 years ago to having like less than 100. And the reason is whackers. Uh, it's a major problem in, amateur, in this part of amateur radio. It also affects other... Um, it, uh, it, uh, it all affects... Other areas like uh people like people in first aid organizations and people in community response organizations and like whatever the equivalent of neighborhood watches in your area, and it's basically where you give someone a little bit of responsibility and it goes to their heads and they start to assume they're part of the mainstream uh, emergency authorities. So it's a big problem in, in America where you get someone gets their ham radio license and then starts to deck out their car with all these lights, thinking they're now part of the emergency services. So much so that uh, the ARRL um, has basically introduced a new program to f weed out the whackers. Uh, and like now to join ARES, you have to go through various inter interviews, uh, do background checks, um, uh, and, know, and have your history basically checked to make sure you're not going to do this because it's scaring off a lot of people who would legitimately want to get involved. Also, a lot of these guys get arrested because they they push the boundaries between uh fake police cars and fake ambulances so uh uh it's less of an issue in the uk but there are there were a couple of guys in raynet who got in trouble for basically painting their car exactly like a police car but instead of saying police it said raynet so uh that's the thing uh, fox hunting again this is like we crossing amateur radio with orienteering so you basically take a, a little tiny transmitter and you hide it in a big area such as a forest or you can make it mobile in a vehicle or, in a, or give it to someone. These transmitters, they'll tr transmit a sound for a few seconds every minute. Uh, basically, you have to find them using directional antennas. Um, it's it's fa I've done it a few times. It's great fun. It's great exercise. It's something you can get the kids involved with. And uh, um, like someone of a license has to take responsibility for the transmitters, but that's easy enough done. And as you can see, they're tiny. That's the size of an SD card. Now, only a few years ago, they would have been the size of... Um, Something bigger than an SD card. Okay, uh, okay, we're getting close to the end. If you're uh, starting to glaze over, a lot of amateurs are obsessed with making long distance contacts. These are the sort of people that be they'd be similar to contesters in that sense. Uh, most international amateur radio organisations they offer awards for making contacts to certain places or certain numbers. The DX Century Club by the ARRL is most prestigious. If you make a contact to 100 countries outside of your continent, you get a nice certificate. And you get different certificates for different modes. So you get one for voice. You may get one for a data mode. You may get one for Morse. Um, there's also uh, special event stations that get set up a lot of time. And those are stations that exist for a day or two or a week to commemorate anniversaries or major tournaments or something like that. Um there was a lot set up for COVID last year. And you know, if you make contact with these temporary stations, there's usually an award you can claim. And there's a thing called the DX Cluster, which is just um, a series of websites that uh, 
whenever you make a long distance contact, you upload your log to that site straight away and someone who's looking at that might notice that you're close to them and you made contact to a country they want to so they can jump in and try make contact with the same uh, receiving station. The expeditions. Right, this is amateur radio operators going off on holidays to somewhere to activate the location. So generally it's usually an island somewhere that no one, hardly anyone lives on or there's no amateur radio operators on. Uh, ideally you want to go somewhere tropical Usually it's just some cold island off the coast. Uh, so, for example, here, this is this is a picture I found uh, uh, in some, uh, off to a, an island off the coast of Greece, I believe. Uh, yeah, ZL's at Greece. And this one on the right was someone who did uh, an activation of Inish Boffin off Galway as part of the Islands on the Air scheme. But probably the most crazy one of all is the 2011 Belgian Rockall D expedition where a couple of radio amateurs decided to set up a radio station on Rockall just for the fun of it. And they paid for this themselves. This wasn't like you know, someone paying them to do this. They did this themselves. Crazy amount of money, and it doesn't exactly look safe, but, you know, uh, it's probably like when people, ask, was a, uh, when people ask, why do you climb a mountain? Because it's there. Uh, okay, amateur satellites. Yes, we have satellites. I'm going to skip over this a bit, maybe talk about the Fun Cube and AMSAT UK, which is the UK body responsible for amateur satellite stuff. They invented a thing called the Fun Cube satellite. It's a nine by nine cube. It could be spring launched by a rocket. Uh, there's a built in radio and there's space for experiments. Um, and the beauty of it is, is ES, European Space Agency and Roscosmos will launch them for free if they have space. OK, it's not free free. You know, there's paperwork and insurance, but it's a lot cheaper than you know, building a commercial satellite and launching it. And that is the FunCube satellite. Uh, that's what it looks like. That's nine by nine. Um, yeah, and this, the plans are, if you want to build one of these, you can. The plans are out there. Boat anchors. Okay. Um, so a lot of amateurs love using old equipment, and it's basically all the old valve gears, and like some people won't even touch the modern stuff. Um, not just amateur radio gear, like they'll, they'll, they'll try to source stuff that was used by the military, by ships in the maritime sector and government agencies. And there's a couple of nets devoted to boat anchors where people talk to each other using this old equipment. It's a dying part of the whole hobby, mainly because tubes are getting harder to find. It's you no, know, and basically once all the, if you need a specific tube and you can't find it, no one's going to make it for you. So that's the end of your radio. Here's a few examples of boat anchors. You may notice the top right is a receiver. The bottom left, you may notice there's a couple of units because back until the 1960s, uh, the idea of a tr uh, radio having built-in receive and transmit capability was weird. So you'd have a separate radio for transmit than receive. And the bottom right, that is actually a Klansman, British Army Klansman backpack radio. And they are extremely popular with amateur radio enthusiasts. They're cheap to get, relatively cheap to get hold of. And as you, you know, no pun intended, they're built like tanks. And I've got a couple of Klan Klansman radios myself and they're, they're quite nice. So um, they're amazing pieces of kit. They were taken out of service uh, mid 90s. Okay, now we're getting onto something the, the ISS. You might find this interesting. So, basically, most of the crew in the ISS are licensed radio amateurs. Uh, they frequently communicate with earthbound amateurs, and a lot of people try and, are always trying to kind of make contact with them when the ISS passes overhead. The ISS, as of three months ago, is also a VHF UHF repeater in the sense that you can send a signal up to the repeater on the ISS and it'll bounce back down to Earth. Uh, and that has become extremely popular. I say VHF, UHF, because you transmit in VHF and the downlink signal comes on UHF. You can access that. You can actually access that using a 30-pound 30 po 30 cheap Chinese handheld radio. And uh, like any licensed amateur can uh, use the repeater or attempt to contact the ISS. Uh, occasionally, the ISS, they do school link-ups. Um, uh, what happens is they you, you set up a radio and children can talk and ask questions to the crew and there's a video downlink so they can see the, the crew on the ISS. It takes about a year of preparation and my club was involved with one a few years back, which I'll come on to. A fair bit of specialised equipment needed. Uh, so uh, you need like uh, two motorised Yagi antennas for the voice communication, two motorised satellite dishes for the video downlink. Uh, audio gear, uh, a satellite receiver to decode the video stream, and of course a radio to do the audio communication. The reason there's two of everything is because you have to have a backup ready to go. Um, 
And uh, the ESA and that, the European Space Agency and NASA actually say if you get selected to communicate with the ISS, the best place, to, the best people to speak to to get your equipment is the local amateur radio club. So this was the one we worked on in Tala Community School in 19th October 2007. That was the setup inside the school um, uh, with all the projectors to, for the video downlinks and the likes. Uh, although we could have bought the downlink satellite dishes, we actually made our own with the school. Uh, so that's one of the ones we built. Um, now we're lucky, and the guy in the back there, that's Dan, he makes all the telemetry equipment that's used by the Commissioners of Irish Lights, which is the Irish Lighthouse Authority. The guy's a genius. So what we did is we went into the school on a couple of occasions and basically got the, the school children to help us build the antenna. Uh, so that was a nice part of it. And it was a, it was a good day out. Got a lot of international coverage. Um, we didn't get involved in the actual transmission. We were there just to make sure everything worked. Um, the reason why the antennas and the dish are motorized is because the ISS moves overhead. So it has to track it exactly. Um, but yeah, it was a fun day. And it's one of those sort of things you get involved in in amateur radio. Um, it's good to have on your CV. Okay, quick talk about the license. You need it because... You can make and modify your own equipment and there's a risk of causing interference. That's the biggest concern. It covers basic electrical theory, radio theory and operating practice. Um, the bigger countries like the UK and the USA have multiple levels. In the UK, you've got foundation, intermediate and advanced. Each level gets you access to more frequencies and allows you to use more power in your transmissions. Smaller countries have just one level. So we have to go for the top level here in Ireland because we're so small. Reciprocity is generally global for temporary um, use. So you can go to the US with your British license and operate there for I think maybe up to a year before having to get their own, you know, the license there. Uh, and that's pretty much the same the world over. It does take a fair bit of studying, but anyone who's got a basic understanding of maths won't have a problem. Now costs, here's where it gets interesting. Uh, if you just want to do VHF stuff and talk local, pardon me, you can buy one of these Baofeng radios. This is a UV5R. They cost about 30 quid and they work perfectly fine for local communication. Uh, this is a, Baofeng is a new Chinese brand. You could get a, a Kenwood or an Icom or one of the, a Yesu, which are the fancy Japanese brands. Yes, those radios cost two, three, four hundred pounds. The difference is they're more durable and they'll last a lot longer. That's, these radios are kind of almost disposable. Once you break them, they're, they're broke. There's not really worth repairing. If you want to get onto HF, the cheapest way would be to pay about 300 euros for a secondhand uh, HF rig and make your own antenna out of wire. Uh, the Kenwood TS990S, currently the most expensive HF rig available at £6,990. I lust over that. I lust over it. Um, Antennas, well, how much do you want to spend? You could make your own dipole for a few quid. That's a wire antenna. Or spend up to 25 grand on a tower with a rotatable Yagi beam. Um, an amplifier, if you want to you know, get above 100 watts, 4K. Uh, at least the license is free in most countries now. Uh, and this is only the basics. Like, there's people will buy all sorts of test, measure, test and measuring equipment that ramps the price up even more. It's just, like, some people go crazy. Um... So yeah, it is. It can be cheap. It can be expensive. It depends how much how much pleasure you don't want to derive from the hobby, and what you what do you want to do with it. So here's an example. So that as a you could make that by yourself for about fifteen pounds worth of material, or if if you can find old wire, make it for free. The thing on the right, you're probably talking about twenty five k or more. And this is the Kenwood TS nine ninety I was talking about. One day it will be mine. QSL cards, another interesting part of the hobby. So if I uh, contact someone and I think it's a DX contact, a rare DX contact, how do I know I've talked to them? Uh, it could be someone nearby pretending to be who they say they are. So generally what we do is you send off QSL cards and they're just basically a postcard that says, confirms that I may contact you on this date and time. Uh, there, There is electronic versions of the Amateur Radio Relay League of America have a thing called the Logbook of the World, which is an electronic version of this, and has the most ridiculously overblown security. It's like more secure than a bank. You had to, I had to send in um, four forms of ID and uh, I get crypto. I get a crypto. Uh, I have to cryptographically sign all my uploads. It's ridiculous, but that's what they do. But and they, this is but the QSL cards are still popular. 
And generally what you do, instead of posting them off individually, you'll post them off in batches to your local uh, representative body in your country where you live. And they'll send them off in batch to other countries and where the representative body in that country will distribute them to the local amateurs. So some statistics, uh, how many amateurs there are in the world. USA is about 761,000. Japan, 435,000. China, 150,000. Uh, UK, 75,000. And Ireland, 1,836. There are dozens of us, literally dozens of us. Global total is an estimated 3 million. Now, these figures are out of date, and the figures have actually gone up since then. I know for a fact the UK is now up to about 84,000. So, uh, so like these figures are about 3 or 4 years old. I couldn't find anything more recent. Um, the number of licensed amateurs started dropping in the, late, in the 90s, and that's probably because of the internet. But over the last 10 years, there's been a steady rise, and now it's at an all-time high all-time high. Only two countries don't have an amateur radio license program, North Korea and Yemen. But the other thing is North Korea allows occasionally allows foreign amateurs in to run a day expedition. And I think they probably overjudge the propaganda value of doing that because it's kind of a mystery why they allow it. Um, so let's say you want to listen in um, and what we're up to. And yeah, you can listen in. There's no law against that. It's the transmitting that you need the license for. You can get these cheap RTL SDR dongles on eBay for about fifteen pound, and they're amazing. So they're basically some. These are TV reception dongles for receiving digital TV signals. But a few years back, someone realised that the chip on board was wideband and could receive from one hundred megahertz up to one point three gigahertz. Uh, so people started adapting them as soft, cheap software defined radios, and they're amazing for the price. They're just fantastic. Um, they won't pick up HF signals. They'll only pick up from like the FM broadcast band upwards, but that's perfectly fine if you want to listen into um, local VHF UHF tra traffic. You can also turn them into virtual radar devices, which will pick up the ADSB radar signals that um, planes give off. For the money, they're they're a great little thing to play around with. If you want a physical radio, there's radios like the Texon PL660, cost about ninety quid, and they'll pick up uh, all the HF bands. If you're buying a shortwave radio, just make sure it has SSB functionality. The FunCube dongle is uh, is basically a professional version, not professional, but an advanced version of the RTL SDR dongle, made by the same people who made the Fun developed the FunCube satellites. They will pick up HF radio, and there's also uh, multiple software defined radios, which are just the new type of radio receiver. Instead of having discrete circuitry, they digitally sample the, the radio spectrum and decode the signal uh, in mathematically and uh, they go from 100 points upwards there's also web sdr uh, which is amazing so believe it or not you can go to a website and control a, uh, a radio remotely uh, there's a list at uh, websdr.org and this is what it looks like and all this this waterfall along the top is all the individual signals that are, that's been picked up in that particular portion of this band you can click on one of those lines there and it'll tune into it 4625 is an interesting one to tune into at night time it's a buzzing sound that's been going off for about 30 years and no one knows what it is all we know is that it's coming from russia uh so the it's um like i say it's the cheapest and easiest way if you want to listen into what what's happening on the hf bands so the future um like, uh, COVID has spurred a massive increase in new people coming into the hobby. Uh, for those in the UK, there's usually about a thousand amateurs come into the hobby each year, and slightly less than that die off, go silent key. Last year, we had 4,000, uh, and that was helped by Ofcom allowing online exams for the first time. Normally, the exams take place in a uh, an environment that's very much like university or GCSE exams. But uh, they developed a way of allowing exams to take place online. And what you need is two cameras. So you need your laptop with a camera looking at you and another device with a camera looking at you from the side. Uh, and they'll let you do the exam at home now. Amateur radio is being embraced by the STEM and maker communities because you know it's, it's free radio spectrum to use for whatever they want. Uh, in terms of the hardware and software, it's, it's, we're moving to so towards software-defined radio. So... In the olden days, radios had discrete circuits, so it came in, it went through inductors, capacitors, resistors, and eventually came out as audio. Now, uh, they, they just sample the radio spectrum digitally 
and mathematically extract signals from it. So uh, there's, there's a lot of work, there's going to be a lot of innovation with science and uh, software development in that a uh, part of the spectrum. The average age of radio amateurs is finally starting to drop. It was creeping up for a long time. It's kind of went like in the 1950s and 60s. It was uh, I think it was like 35, and over the years it sort of crept up to about 52. But in the last years it's starting to go back down into the 40s. So it's now 47, 48, and that's a good sign. And recently, a lot of new Chinese radio manufacturers have been entering the market. For example, Baofeng there, you know, their cheap radio, and that's really helping you know, people get into into the hobby. Not many HF radios, but they're coming. They're coming. So if you want a, more info, uh, the best way is to speak to your local club if you want to, and you get in contact with your local club for your national representative body. So in the UK, it's the Radio Society of Great Britain. In America, it's the Amateur Radio Relay League. Here in Ireland, it's the Irish Radio Transmitter Society. Uh, the IRAU is the international body for amateur radio, and I've put down the South African Radio League because... They offer a really good manual for amateur radio. If you want to study the, uh, to do the exams, they give you a free manual. The operating practice side of it, of it is not really useful in outside of South Africa, but the technical and radio side of it is perfectly fine. Uh, and the IRTS here in Ireland also offer something similar. <clears throat> uh, if you want to keep up on the latest news in amateur radio, Southgate AR Amateur Radio News is is the standard website everyone goes to. They have all the latest news. It's like they run it like a professional news organization. I didn't realize there was just so much news in the amateur radio world. There's our amateur radio news line, which is a, um, which is an audio program, which is, uh, it's been going for 30, 40 years and always has latest news. It's American based and YouTube is a goldmine for stuff. If there's something you're interested in, do a search like SSTV tutorial. There'll be a video on it on YouTube. It's, there's just so much useful information there. Uh, there's my shack. I just want to put that in just for um to show you. It's like it's quite a nice one. It's a bit cold in the winter, but um I oh, I'm happy with it. It's it's cozy and it's my place, and it's out in the backyard. And uh, so, any questions or do you want to send me some questions via the chat or before we head over to the Zoom? Okay, let's see. Much porn? Uh, not no, not. Uh, well, tell your friend there's not any substantial stuff. Okay. Uh, it's yeah, James. It is growing as a hobby. Um, it's like I say, like this last year was a massive boom. I think everyone stuck at home with COVID. Uh, got involved. There is a a lot of pe it's a hobby where a lot of people want to get involved, but they don't have the time or the resources to study for the exam. And I think COVID helped a lot to get those people in. So suddenly they they had the time to study and take the exam. Uh, is it used by dissidents and refusing? Uh, yes, it is. James, is it used by dissidents and refusing living in liberal regimes? Actually, it is. Um, generally, though, they would. Uh, it has. Yes, historically, it has been used for getting information in and out. Um, uh, I don't have any recent examples, but definitely no. During the communist eras of Eastern Europe, there would have been a lot of people using amateur radio equipment. So uh, there you go. Okay. I will shut this down, uh, end the stream, and I'll meet you all in Zoom.